of those requiring hospitalization, 85% were non-tasters. 0% were super tasters. It actually is a good way to help stratify the order in which people could receive vaccination, especially in countries where resources are limited. So you may have heard about something where the taste receptors in your mouth, especially the bitterness, if you're what we call a super taster, has an extremely strong correlation. And this sounds so wild at first, so it really took me a while to understand how this happens. It can actually affect how well you clear viruses. So much so that people that are able to taste bitterness really well have a much higher clearance rate to pre prevent that virus from going into your body than those people that may not have strong taste receptors. And here's where it really got kind of cool for me is we know it's a genetic thing, right? So Mendelian genetics, 25% won't have any good taste receptors, 25% will be amazing, and then everyone else is in the middle. So I said, well, how, why would that translate to the older population having more problems and kids not? And then you told me, well, what happens when you get older to your taste receptors? So the genetics don't matter as much at that point, but your taste re receptors get blunted. And what's the first thing that kids say usually when you try to give them broccoli or any of, you know, a lot of foods or drinks, they say, look, this is bitter, I don't like it. So it's important to remember that the taste receptors change that way too. All that to say, I'm with Dr. Henry Barham, who made this relationship, basically theorized it at first to say, is there a relationship here with clearance? And though it sounds kind of far-fetched at first, there's a reason and sequence of things that brought you here. Being an ENT specialist, uh, he was kind of thinking of the question, why do some people have chronic sinusitis and really battle it and have trouble with inflammation? And whereas me, I've never had it in my entire life. And they started looking at saying, is there something that basically reduces the clearance of stuff to where you're just constantly either inflamed or have problems clearing things? And that's where you started looking at it, right? Is, is what is that mechanism why people do have chronic sinusitis and don't? Yeah, so... Um... It has been fascinating. So this, this receptor, um, we've studied it previously to sinusitis, because, or it's actually a family of receptors, but we've studied it to sinusitis. And people, as you said, with very high expression of the receptor have a much less likelihood of having chronic sinusitis or recurrent acute sinusitis, meaning recurrent bacterial infections, than people who don't express the receptor. They actually have a much increased incidence of, of those two conditions. And so that's where we sort of had the idea of, I wonder if this you know, plays out to a virus. And sort of the reason I love research is, it, I mean, is part of this study. It has been fascinating. And so part of the scientific method is, is to disprove something. And so like you, maybe you have this idea or you have this theory. Well, the whole point is to design a study to try to disprove it. And right. that, was, that was kind of the beauty of, of doing this prospective study because we did a retrospective study early in COVID where, you know, I was doing all the airway surgeries um, on people who were very sick with COVID in the hospital via you know, either tracheostomy or nasal procedures. Um, and I wasn't getting COVID and it kind of didn't make sense of like why, you know, people talk about, oh, I have a ton of exposure to COVID. I had like crazy amounts, as you can imagine, with doing tracheostomies on active COVID patients or doing nasal endoscopies um, on people who don't know if they just have a cold or it turns out they actually had COVID. Um, and I never got COVID and it sort of um, didn't make sense. And so I started testing people who, you know, were either in our practice or in the hospital who were already diagnosed with COVID. And I tested them to basically a taste test looking at their expression of this receptor. So as you talked about, um, you know, genetically, you can inherit uh, this family of receptors and you either have, you know, two good genes for it and you have very high expression or you have one, you know, one gene and one not so great gene and you have medium level of expression or you have two bad genes and you essentially have no expression of the receptors. And but, but to that point, and I want to say this, cause I'm sure you're watching this and thinking, oh my gosh, do I have like, you know, this taste sensitivity or, yeah. or why, I never get carnal sinusitis. I get it all the time. So like that bitterness, you apparently, you know, are pretty sensitive to this, what we're going to talk about. If you're sensitive to bitterness, you're a super taster, you don't get the infection and your exposure, exactly like you said, is way higher than being exposed, you know, being literally in the yeah. head and neck. Black coffee, people that are like super tasters don't care for black coffee. It's very like polarizing or like, you know, hard alcohol and things yeah. like that. I myself am actually a super taster or close, high expressor based on your test. Yeah. And, and that's actually what made you 
you started with inflammation and then you thought, okay, well, let's look at, you know, simple species like rats. How do they know when they're walking around, they're like, oh, I want to eat. And then should I have this? Should I not? If they just did it without any kind of like uh, sense about what may be good or bad, obviously they would die off at high, at high amounts. Yeah. And so you took that inflammation process and you said, is there something where these rats or these kind of simpler species are smelling something and do they have a mechanism in place to either polarize them and say, dude, there's something not right about what I'm about to consume, which usually happens when you have, you know, something with infections in it. And then also if they did want to go ahead and consume it, something had to make sure that their survival in the world like continued. And so you extrapolated to the rat to rats and then I, it is true. Just one day you were like, wait a second. Yeah. Is there something about this expression that may be applicable to this, to this, you know, virus? Yeah, no, that's the, that has been the beauty of this um, study and this test uh, overall, because phenotypic expression is what matters. So you talked about the genetics of it and how it's 25, 50 or 25, but really the phenotypic expression, which is your outward expression of your genetic makeup but influenced by age, you know, diet, weight, sort of comorbidities, um, can decrease your overall expression. Well, phenotypic expression is what matters because right. you can have genetically, you should have high expression, but if you're, you know, 75 years old and you have low expression, well, that's the way you're going to behave is how, you know, how well your receptors are functioning. But my dad, like he, he drank hot coffee his entire life. So when I gave him the initial test that you studied with, like he couldn't taste anything. Yeah. So we were terrified. I put him in a bubble. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't matter what his genotype was. Yeah. Even if I'm a super taster from both of them, the dude lost all of his taste receptors sure. from his life, uh, lifelong drinking hot tea, which is a big Indian thing. But anyway, sure. um, so that that's such an important distinction right like if you have it and if you don't but but the key is when you're looking at the phenotypic and genotypic expression some observations you started making was like where are the places that people did really poorly with covid yeah and that's the first question you asked you're like okay if it's if it's 25% 50% 25% then what you would expect is to that distribution of the people that have problems and obviously we know that that's not necessarily the case. You had, you had a study where you kind of looked backwards and said, why was so many more of the people that actually were admitted with really bad problems, you know, 80 plus percent, right? 80 to 90% were, were, even though they genotypically constitute only 25%. But then you also looked at other places in the world while, while this pandemic was happening, right? Yeah. Is the expression the same in Italy and other places? No, so it's, it's interesting. So there was actually a study uh, previously in Nature looking at expression of these receptors. These, these receptors have been studied to like longevity. Do they influence just, oh. yeah, overall, like how long people live that sort of weighed into it and diet, obesity, obviously, as they're part of contribute to taste. Um, but yeah, there are parts of the world that actually have low expression of this that did more poorly to COVID, which is fascinating. And then you have, you know, typically um, Northern Europe uh, tend to have higher expression. Um, places like, uh, you know, Southeast Asia tend to have higher expression of it. And so it can vary depending on obviously sort of the genetic makeup through, you know, years of, of sort of changing your genetics. I don't, I don't know that I'd include that in there. I don't want to Right. get too much into that. But the, the fascinating point of this initial study is we took people who were had COVID and we tested them to a simple, basically taste test measuring their expression of this receptor. And zero out of them were super tasters or had very high expression. 79 out of 100 were tasters or they were in the middle group. 21 out of 100 were non-tasters. They didn't get anything. Well, all 21 required hospital admission zero of the 79 required hospital admission. And then you didn't have anybody in the high expression group or the super taster group who got COVID in the first place. And so- So, so of the 100 people, yeah. I need to make sure I understand this correctly. Of the 100 people, 21 of them- Were non-tasters. Got admitted with yes. a complication. And 21 out of 21 of those were non-expressors, meaning they did not have the receptors for bitterness. Yes. And then the other 71 were either had great receptors or were intermediate. They well phenotypically they were middle of the road. Right. Or they were middle of the road. Yeah. Okay. So not even necessarily super tasters. No, none super tasters who got COVID. So that was the retrospective. Right. Thing. So somebody and might that, ask based on that on that, they may say, Well, hold on. We know that taste and, and smell kind of get affected with yep. COVID. What if the ones that were admitted were the ones that maybe and it's not that high. Lost it's supposed to be five percent. But yeah. yeah, what if you even argued 
not 5%, but 90% of them lost their taste and smell. And that's why you're not testing it. Yeah, great question. And that was why it was really exciting to do the prospective study. So we designed the prospective study. So prospective meaning, meaning before they got infections. Yes. You, you tested beforehand. Group, you follow a cohort of people through COVID, right? And so what we did was because of the assumption that you lose your smell and taste, and that's why the receptor is altered. We took hospital workers, mm -hmm. um, tested them to their expression of this receptor, tested okay. them PCR for active COVID, okay. tested them antibody to prior infection. To Make COVID. sure they didn't already have it. You got it. it. If they had a positive PCR or antibody, they were excluded from this study. Okay, so you made sure that these people did didn't, not have an active or passed by any, the best testing we had, that they did not get COVID yet. You got it. Okay. And then did a genetic analysis on a subgroup of those to see how accurate our interpretation of this phenotypic expression was. Okay, so you, so you measured how sensitive are they to bitterness and how well can they taste? And then you went in the background and actually looked at their genetics and what to see what they the correlation have, was. Okay, Then that's followed important. them until they got COVID or a group of them got COVID, right? And repeated the taste test to see Afterwards. when they lost their smell and taste, did the taste change? Did their expression or their perception of bitterness change oh. after they got COVID? To test that previous theory, is you it because it. they lost it? Okay, and? Had none fall out of their group. So some people change on a level of about two out of 10, 20%. And that's just, that's basically subjectivity. Right. But did not have anyone change groups. And how many was that that did get COVID that didn't change? Well, or per the have... study, okay. the study's around 235. Okay. We've now tested over 17,000, have had about 2,000 convert to COVID and have tested those and have still not had any more. So they don't. So that addresses that one theory is like, well, maybe they just are looking like non-expressors and that's why they got admitted because they lost it. But really, it much higher numbers that shows you don't really lose that taste yeah. with, the, with the COVID. So At least not to this receptor. To because this receptor, that's an interesting sorry. point. Yeah. It, does, it does contribute to taste, but it's not truly part like taste and smell, right? It's not your smell. Right. It does contribute to bitterness, but it's actually what the taste test is, uh -huh. is a series of chemicals that are known direct stimulants of this receptor. And when the receptor activates, you perceive it as a bitter taste. It's not like you're, it's not like a flavor. Right. right? Does that makes sense? That's an important concept. It's the chemicals that stimulate an arm or a protein or receptor. And then that guy is the one that makes like the perception of taste. You got it. It's not the fact that the taste or flavor then jogs the receptor and says, hey, make this yes. you know, connection. Yeah. So this is such an important concept for a second, because if you're hearing this, you're thinking, but stop, like it's the bitterness, but how does that you know, clear the virus? What we're saying is the bitterness is the sensation of bitterness is a byproduct of stimulation of a receptor slash protein, like everything works in our body. Like we already know that's how stuff works, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, proteins and receptors and, and that's how everything from head to toe works. So the bitterness is more like of a collateral observation to signify the presence of something. You got and it. that something is what stimulates and, and brought on all your, you know, study what's called innate immunity. And this is so key because innate immunity, and you know, this is coming from a hematologist and stuff, it's different than what's called humoral or, or memory immunity. Yeah. Those things, you need an exposure, and that's the whole concept behind a vaccine, or I don't need the vaccine, I already have my antibodies, so the virus, whatever, you, whatever it is, if you have the antibodies, you have a defense system that has been specialized and trained to attack something on entry. Yeah. That's learned. Yeah. You cannot, I don't care if you're the baddest working on the gym all the time, you're not gonna fight something that you've never exposed right. based on your humoral or memory uh, immune system. Yeah. What you will do, what all of us do, and when people say your immunity is good, your immunity is bad, is really what they're talking about is kind of, I hate to say dumber, but the people that like, you know, when you play chess or back in the kingdom days, they just have the shield and they're the everyday village people that come in and first, you know, fight fight the forefront. That's what innate, innate immunity is. It's not necessarily that they're, you know, they're, you know wizards knowing who, how to identify somebody. They just come and kill to keep things from getting into the places that matter most. Our mouth, our sinuses, our lungs. That's innate immunity. And so you're saying, and that's what, I guess that's what precipitated all this, was the stimulation of that is what directly affects 
how you clear things out of your nose and out of your mouth and why you may have more sinusitis than somebody else that doesn't and why somebody may not, right? So that's, that's, that's what we're looking at here. It has nothing to do with an exposure. Right. Yeah, so that was that was sort of the, the common thing early on when I you know wasn't getting COVID. People would sort of dismiss it and say, "Oh, well, you work in a hospital, you're a doctor, and um, your immune system strong," which that that's nice that they said that, but that makes no sense because you can't have humoral or adaptive or mem- memory immunity to something that is novel, meaning right. no one has ever seen it before. And so you can't have antibodies to it to protect you. And so if someone were to have protection, it would have to be innate immunity, meaning something they're born with, something right. that was there the whole time that doesn't change. And so, um, as you said, sort of their barrier of defense. And so the way that this receptor works, as you said, yes, we have a byproduct that we perceive as taste, and that's actually an easy way to test for it but actually what the receptor does is it is expressed throughout your respiratory tract. We tested on the tongue, but initially found it in the nose. It's in your trachea, it's in your lungs, it's even in your GI tract. And so the way that it works is when you have a stimulus for it, whether it be a potential pathogen or we use a chemical to stimulate it, when the receptor activates, yes, you perceive it as a taste and that's the receptor activating, but it actually does several things. It increases mucociliary clearance, meaning like the little hair cells that sweep things along to get rid of it. Yeah, increases mucus production to sort of dilute things out And then one of the end byproducts is nitric oxide. That's important because nitric oxide was shown previously to prevent maturation of the spike protein. So the spike protein that everybody sort of heard about with COVID, um, it's become sort of famous. Nitric oxide as produced by this receptor on a local mucosal level prevents that receptor from activating. Well, if you know about viruses, a virus can't live by itself. It needs a host. Okay, well, if that host prevents it from maturing and replicating, it stops. And this is not a new concept. We know nitrous Correct. oxide. Nitric, I mean, that's, yeah. that's just known fact for, for anyone in ENT yeah. or immunity stuff. That's that's a very you know common thing we know that helps clear things and destroy things before they replicate. Yeah. But what you're saying is that very well-known mechanism, that nitrous oxide stimulation you have found is stimulated to get the nitrous oxide by the stimulation of what protein is it or what receptor? It's a T2R. So TAS2R is what they're called. TAS-T2R. Yeah. That receptor is stimulated and thereby has this cascade of immune defense, basically. Yeah, for innate like, immunity to protect the to subject. To protect you. Yeah. But to go back, the whole point of bitterness is we, we said you can't test to see if you have the receptor based on your genetics. Because, again, you've made that distinction clear. Your genetics isn't enough. One, you have to have the genetics for it. Yeah. But short of biopsying the tongue or biopsying the nose and somehow looking at a molecular protein level for the receptor, you used as a second hand way to perceive the bitterness. Yeah. And that correlation is obviously well supported, right? There's, yeah. there's no question about that. Right. And so that, that actually has been another sort of fascinating point of all of this is um, through all of this, in addition to like the crazy sort of like mind blowing discovery of like, how in the world is this predictive? How, you know, like this is crazy. You literally have a, you know, you hear all these stories and it makes people fearful of like a 40 year old who's otherwise like healthy. He works out every day. He jogs, right. he gets like hammered with COVID and he like is laid up for weeks or he gets admitted. You have his, you know, his spouse who doesn't get it and you have their kids who get it, but with like mild symptoms, like all in a of household, those, like yeah. why did somebody get really yeah. sick and other people like, I don't know how I Didn't couldn't have gotten it, it but, yes. I, but I slept I in the same bed with him. Yeah. Right. Um, and so like all those stories that we tested, I mean, it all sort of panned out. And so that's where I was like, okay, this is crazy. You know, how does, how does this continue to work? But sort of the, the beauty behind this is we've now sort of worked on a test that, um, you know, we can distribute to people because the question is like when people hear about it and they say, okay, what do I do? How do I get this test? Like I want to get tested. Right. And there's, there's tons of different ones out there. The problem is, is they're not terribly accurate. Right. Or they'll say, it's all saying one to 10. You just have to pick a number on how strong it is, which is, or it's like you either have the receptor or you don't, but, but how helpful is that? Because what if you have like a very low expression, technically you haven't, but, but you're still, you can't behave like somebody who has very high expression right. and it just tells you you have them. So we've actually refined a test that is incredibly accurate to the point of around 94.2% accuracy in predicting genotype. Meaning, genotype. So yeah, if so you like, have the genetics. So like if we test people to this, te- to this taste test and then did a genetic analysis 
over 94% of the time it was accurate in predicting what their genes say it should have been. But the beauty of this is it is a simple, inexpensive, easily scalable test that people can do at their own home, right? As opposed to a genetic test, right. which you're sending off blood, you're sort of waiting, it's more invasive, it's more expensive. Um, and the phenotype or the outward expression is actually what matters. So even if- But that's what you're testing. Yeah, so we're the test, testing the phenotype. You're saying it corresponds 94% to what is in actuality. Yes. But the main point is whether like it, you're actually testing the, the actual expression of it, correct? Because the times that it wasn't accurate, were in the older group, meaning it said they should have, their genetics said they should have been in higher group, but phenotypically they actually- It didn't matter because they didn't because have the expression. that's actually what matters. Right, and that's all yes. So your test is testing that part. You got it. Of actually the expression. Yes. Because, and that's because that's what matters. The older people that did have yep. the genotype that 25% of older people, obviously that's just not the case because yep. they still you know do more poorly in addition to some other reasons like comorbidities and right. stuff. So let me ask you this. And, you know, I'm particularly, my heart's been heavy lately for everything that's going on in India and just how much sure. true just turmoil is going on there. Yeah. So, um, and we can get on to the subject of variants. And if you don't stop it, even if you don't have symptoms, you could be patient zero that makes a new variant and suddenly it's, you know, COVID 2.0. Short of all of that stuff, when I have the most, pop, you know, common question is I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm in my 30s, I'm 40s. I really don't think, I've had this exact phrase multiple times, I really think, and they'll use the word immune, my immune system is healthy enough and I'm young and healthy enough to be able to like, you know, just take my chances, which each their own, I, I you know, obviously, especially with India and everything, I very much believe that if we can, if it's not high risk, you should do the vaccine. But in those people that just really just had their gut feeling don't feel good about it based on the facts that they know at this point and kind of their own education, which I love and respect when people educate themselves to, to make decisions. I mean, that's the way the world should be. But if they have all that data and they make that decision, could they feel like maybe this could be something to where if I test it, even if I'm 30 and healthy and I'm really a non-expressor, apparently based on your prospective data, it really puts me in a different bucket yeah. group more accurately than the fact that I'm young and healthy. Yeah. This is more correlated than my age and my health, correct? Yeah, so I do, um, great question. I think that that is the value of this test and this study, truthfully. So what this test, what the data has shown in this study is that this test can help predict duration and severity of symptoms. Meaning, yes, if you have a new you know, strain of this coronavirus or it mutates or you have some other new novel virus, this should stay true because it's part of your innate immunity. Right. And we've actually now studied it to other viruses, not just COVID. Um, Basically to validate what we expected. You got because it. Because it's innate. It has nothing yes. to do with memory. And so I would argue it actually is a good way to help stratify the order in which people could receive vaccination, especially in countries where resources are limited. Yes. So you have a inexpensive, widely available test that someone can take at their own home and know how much risk they really have. Meaning, right. and I'm not saying that they're safe, but I'm saying you have a lot of people who assume, oh, I'm 30, I'm healthy, I have a strong immune system. But you can't have a strong immune system unless it's innate. And if this were to say that you have no expression of this receptor, I would advise, you know, consider getting vaccinated right. or consider certainly protecting yourself, you know, wearing masks, washing your hands. Um, but you're advising that not because of theory. No, but because, because we've proven there's evidence data. Yeah. and that statistics, those statistics are good, I yes. assume. Yeah. Like, you know, a very strong yeah, correlation, so small, to, to you your know, question, P value. Prospective, so prospective data of a p-value. So anytime you're doing a scientific study, a p-value is basically the chance that it happened by, you know, random chance or, right. you know, that it was just coincidence. And so anything less than 0.05 is scientifically st uh, significant or statistically significant. Meaning it couldn't have just been by this loose connection chance, that yeah. there's actually a relationship at so play. So ours was as low as you can go. So the 0.001, that we listed as 0.01. So what it showed, so prospective study was of those requiring hospitalization, 85% were non-tasters. 0% were super tasters. 15% were in the middle group. Now, the interesting point there is of those 15% requiring hospitalization that were in the middle group, the youngest one was 69 and the average age is 74. That's a wear off of the receptors, meaning right. they are in the middle group, 
but as you get older, they wear down and you start to trend towards the non-taster group. Just like you pointed out earlier, kids who can be in the taster group are gonna trend towards the super taster group because they have high expression as a child. Right. Just like when you give a child broccoli and it's like, this is terrible. Right. It's much stronger than when they're old. you give it to an older adult. So what was the youngest age in the group that were non-expressors that ended up requiring hospitalization, the 85%? Uh, the age the, was less, I guess the average, right? Yeah, in the 40s was the lowest one, but that was he, you know, certain or that subject was certainly on the sort of the low end. It definitely like age definitely age weighs matters in. either way, whether you yes. express or not, you're at a higher risk because you lose your expression and so over time. I point out the hospitalization rate, but like the the most interesting point was actually duration and severity of symptoms. Meaning if you look at the three groups as they prospectively got COVID, if you just look at the average duration of symptoms, so super tasters, five days. Okay. So those are the group who literally it was just like, they often didn't know they had COVID or it was like, you know, through the better part of a weekend, they'll say I had some congestion, but I didn't go get tested because there's no, you know, there's yeah. no way that was COVID. Yeah. Well, we were making them get tested because of occupational exposure. Right. So that's how we knew they were positive. Well, I, I ended up being, before I got my vaccine, I checked my antibodies and I was yeah. positive and I was shocked. You didn't know that you had had it. Yeah. And so yeah. I thought back, I, of course, I didn't have any time off, you know, during COVID to work yep. through it. So I'm, I'm sure I got Super it before spread. we even knew it was here. I'm kidding. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm um, kidding. But so I assume I got it. There was a, it was two periods, you know, from January, February of 2020 onward, yep. where I'm like, maybe it was one of those two periods. And I had just maybe some fatigue, yeah. two or three days and, and, and maybe a sniffle, but that's me forcing the issue, which I would have never suspected, but my antibody yeah. wasn't positive. And so, and yeah. So if you look at the duration amongst each group, so super tasters, five days. Mild symptoms, they often don't know they have it. Tasters in the middle group, 13.5 days. Okay, around two weeks. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a bigger deal. That's for intermediate? Is 13 yes. So it's so, almost it's two and a half times as much long. So non-tasters, on average across all ages, 23.7 days. You're talking about three and a half weeks of symptoms, regardless of comorbidities, okay, in that group when they got COVID. So number one, that's like fascinating. Number two, like, how do you, okay, so what do you do with that? There's your prime example of someone who says, you know, I'm 30, I'm healthy. I have a strong immune system. They're, they have the potential, not, not all of them, but they have the potential to get very sick because that average duration. And obviously you had some people much longer than that because right. that's an average. Um, but sort of a, a nice analogy of looking at, okay, well, how does it work? Well, we just talked about how the receptor works and how it potentially prevents you from getting COVID or the virus from replicating. Imagine that you have three people. Mm -hmm. One has very high expression of the receptor. Mm -hmm. They produce a lot of nitric oxide. They sweep things along with mucociliary clearance. Never had sinus eyes. Yeah. So then, then you have the middle group, the taster group. Okay. Moderate expression. They produce some nitric oxide. They sweep some things along, but not on the same level as this group. Right. Then you have the third person who's a non-taster. They don't express the receptor, so they don't produce the nitric oxide. Basically, you give them all, and this is sort of a rudimentary, you know, sort of example, but you give them all 100 viral particles, okay? This group, they're probably going to kill off a large percentage of those, or the virus is just not going to continue on because it can't replicate because of the nitric oxide. Right. So say you give them 100, say they have five viral particles that go, that go systemic, and they get a mild infection. Middle group, you give them 100 viral particles, Say they, you know, they express it, but not on the same level. So say they kill off 50 of the viral particles. Right. So they're going to get a more severe illness. What about this group? You give them 100, they have no barrier of defense, as you talked about sort of the ancient soldiers. They right. have no one protecting their castle. You pass the moat and you're in the They castle get all 100 viral horse. particles, which is going to give them a much longer and more severe course of illness. You know, that I post on social media and I tried to stay afloat with COVID because as a hematologist, there was a lot of, you know, blood complications to yeah. the point where it was a you know debate. Is it a respiratory illness? Is it blood illness? And I love that you use the word systemic. You have to, you, somebody say, well, why is it all sniffles, this and that? You get into real issues when it starts to multiply and go systemically. Your blood yeah. obviously circulates head to toe. And that's where you get these cascades of respiratory issues and blood issues. But the most common comment I got on my social media, media videos and posts is so many people in their 30s and 40s, I don't understand. I'm young and healthy. I don't fit any of the criteria for why uh, I'm supposed to do unwell. And I'm literally eight or 12 weeks in and I'm just wiped out fatigue. Yeah. I like, I'm, I'm still not recovered. I'm three weeks out. And basically they were concerned for their life because they said this doesn't fit the statistics. So that's but then if you if you partition it yeah. and triage it, you'll say actually it does fit and it is more consistent in this group should you be a non-expressor. Yeah, it's a great point on sort of the, the young person who's healthy 
uh, saying like, I don't understand how I got as sick as I did with COVID. It's actually a good um, way to show the difference between adaptive and innate immune system. So adaptive or, or humoral immune system is really a systemic response. So everybody knows about, you know, antibodies now and vaccination. So what those are is a vaccination classically is like a, either a dead or a small amount of virus that is injected that causes your humoral immune system to make antibodies so that if you're exposed to a high level or to the actual active virus, you will quickly form an adaptive or a memory immune response to fight it off. Right. right? What your innate immune system is, is your initial barrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like if you have someone who doesn't have a strong innate immune system, so what we're studying is these receptors. Mm -hmm. Someone has low expression of these receptors, the theory is that they don't, you know, produce the sort of byproducts to prevent the virus from replicating for them to get sick. If they have that the upfront defense, yes, yeah. if they have a poor upfront defense, well, then they are going to develop a high systemic response, meaning right. a high viral load systemically in their bloodstream, right. right? Which is going to give them a longer duration and severity of illness. Right, because it's As circulating, opposed, it's replicating, it's hungry, it's getting to feed right. all through the blood now. As opposed to the person who's like, you know, through COVID, they've gotten you know, tested for COVID 10 times and they've been negative every time they don't have antibodies. Um, it's because it never had, penetrated. Yeah, that's, that's the system. assumption is that it, you know, you produce an, enough nitric oxide that it prevented them from getting the infection systemically. So that's where your innate immune system comes in. As you said, it's a barrier of defense as opposed to the systemic infection. So theoretically, some of these people that, that <laughs> you know, swore they had it just for a brief second and they keep being negative, but everyone is sick in their house. The reason their antibody may be negative is because your, you know, poor village people with this shield in the castle, they did such a good job yeah. that you actually need entry of the, of, of the, you know, the bad guys to go past them and into the castle. Only when you're systemically in the castle can you even make or get that a, a, a large response to yeah. make the adaptive immunity. You got it. So the one thing that's a little concerning is then the people that have such a good response to stop them, you know, before the moat, they probably need the vaccine even more, right? Because what happens when, say their need immunity goes off, say you need radiation in your mouth or say, you know, from head and neck cancer or some way it went off. Now you've gone your whole life not really getting a lot of penetration to build these good antibodies. Yeah. But as you get older, you know. It's a, no, look, it's a, it's a super fascinating question. And um, it, it's one that we are, are now studying. Um, it's a different answer though, meaning, do, you know, people ask me all the time, do, should I get the vaccine? And I, I mean, I do think that ultimately that's the way that, that we get past this, you know, as a society. But when I look at, obviously I'm not an expert on vaccination or, I mean, not nearly as much as you are on the humoral immune response and things like that. I just, I know about this receptor. And so um, to your question, it would make sense, and this is what we're studying, that if you have someone with high expression of this receptor, they're actually going to be at risk later in life to get very ill from something. For instance, if you, you know, if it's the difference between innate and humoral immune system, if you have a lifetime of an incredibly active and well-functioning innate immune system Outer barrier, barrier right. yes. then the people in the castle are super weak. They haven't thought, yes. they have no experience. You actually are going to have a poorly or underdeveloped humoral immune system if you have not been vaccinated to various influenzas, coronaviruses now, um, different viruses and infections. And so if you have a poorly developed humoral immune system, you have the chance to mount an inappropriate immune response or inappropriate humoral immune response if you get a severe right. infection when your innate immune system wears down and it will later in life. As we talked about earlier, that the receptors wear down as you get older, then what about that group? So they have the potential to get sick later in life. And so that, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's- So you're basically telling me we as human beings, we have to die at some point. You're telling me this is Until there's we no way figure to out this. that this barrier, we no. can stimulate it totally and, you know- Well, I appreciate you sharing all this. And it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like the test and, and, and understanding if you have a good innate immunity, I mean, that's not a COVID thing. That applies across the board because right. you're really testing to see how well do you clear things. So. Yeah. God forbid if it's, you know, COVID 2.0, that's a variant. If it's, you know, the flu season, it's going to maybe be a lot worse because it was quiet this year. Who knows? That stuff is a, is a, is a you know, a litmus test or an assessment of really just your upfront, you know, immunity at this time. Yeah. But I really should, 
again, this is theoretical and, and extrapolated, but but I should probably test it again in 10, 15 years yeah. to make sure that it, you know, because the phenotype type or the expression may get worse over time. Actually, in um, on y'all's site, Dr. Pedia recently said, um, you know, never in our history have has a single disease brought, you know, the amount of scientific questioning or great scientific minds coming together trying to figure something out. Um, I'm certainly not in that group, but it it is been it has been fascinating to watch um, the amount of discovery. And so obviously, COVID has been terrible across our you know world and sort of disrupted life as we know it. There have been some good things. So like the some of the scientific discoveries that have happened over the last twelve months wouldn't have happened. Right, they were accelerated. Yeah, and yeah. so you know the mRNA vaccine coming out. That that I mean that's scientifically that's incredible right um obviously we were not expecting this but to your point the these receptors appear not just predictive of covid that's the beauty of it is it's part of a innate immune system it's so now you know we're studying it's influenza upper respiratory infections in general viral you know included all of those and so like it should stand true even if there's you know another viral outbreak or another new novel right. virus or a mutation of this one that changes these results should still stand true, right? You know, and so like because it's a, kind of, again, you're not testing an a, it's a not body a or memory, right? It's not a medication. It's not a treatment. It's literally information right. that you're giving people. Yeah. And so that's been you know one of the the great points of this recently is I've worked with this company Phenomune to distribute this test, which is you know inexpensive but available to everyone so they yeah. can know what group they're in. Well, I was going to ask because I've gotten the test for my family members yeah. and I've gotten different ones yeah. on Amazon. But I read your the one that you were talking about the data with the ninety four percent concordance and and looks at different things. That is phenoimmune with the pH, correct? Yeah. Because I do want my you know it's important to me, especially when we visit you know grandparents and extended family right. members. Um, it just kind of again gauges your level of yeah, of it's responsibility. Cool. It calculates it for you. That's kind of the the beauty of this new one. So phenoimmune uses they. I mean, it's a, a series of tests, but they it automatically calculates what group you're in. It then is going to be tailored towards. Uh, increasing expression per your level of expression and so like ways that you can improve it and so the company specifically yeah so the company's oh, done a wow. great job at like okay give people information you know easily but then also how can we help them in yeah. the future and so I mean, that's kind of, ultimately why you did all this at yeah. first you wanted to help people with sinusitis you know don't know how much you care about the rats but then yeah, you're sure. thinking if i can they're have some application <laughs> eh, rats are rats, yeah. you know I hear no, they're much I mean, cleaner than that, that's kind of the the has been awesome. So from like an altruistic standpoint, the beauty of this study and this finding is like this test is like super cheap, accurate, scalable, and like really helpful. Just help us be like, responsible. Yeah. Which people like, want to be. I mean, they're I mean, wearing math at distance. They, yes. We did all these things. It's an extra layer of being able yep. to assume responsibility to protect yep. each other. And that's, that's fascinating, yeah. obviously. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you, no, Dr. Thank Barham. You. This was amazing. Yeah. And uh, I look forward to hearing more. And, yeah. and I think you're filming content for Doctorpedia. And you'll be able to have kind of more tailored, detailed, scientific, or you know, some of the idiosyncrasies about stuff uh, that you found in your research uh, available at that site. So thank you all very much. And whatever thoughts and comments you have, you can post below and give us the follow and subscribe for more content. Hopefully we can get this guy uh, to give us some, some more information. Thank you.